God's people, confused and misled, falsely sentenced Jesus to the most gruesome execution of all, death on a cross. In that moment, evil claimed victory. His claim, you have been defeated because your Jesus has been defeated. There is no hope. But that was Friday. Hey, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. Yeah, I'm so glad to see all of you here. I wanted to draw your attention one more time to our uh, Give My Seat cards and explain what these are. You are in one of our services that tends to be uh, more crowded than others, so we expect this service on Easter Sunday to not only be full, uh, but an overflow capacity. We'll have our overflow area set up on uh, next Sunday. But we wanted to ask you to consider, if you want to make sure you have uh, a place to, to sit uh, and you want to maybe open up your seat for someone who only joins us maybe a couple times a year, one way you could do that and bless uh, those uh, commu- members of our community with your seat would be to uh, commit to coming here uh, at our 8.30 service instead of this service, or to come at our 1 o'clock service instead of this service. And if you uh, are thinking about what that could look like and if that might be something your family could do, that would be a huge blessing to us. It would take off a lot of uh, pressure uh, during this service next week. So one of the ways we're giving you to communicate that you would like to do that is with this card. All you need to do is write your name on it, how many people are in your, uh, your family, and just hand this to someone on your way out so that we know to count on you in a different service next week. This card does not mean we want you to give up your seat and not show up next week. We're hoping that everyone would join us. We're going to have an incredible uh, time next week. We are we're in week two of a series called Don't Be Fooled. None of us likes being fooled, right? Uh, we don't enjoy it, right? We don't like being the, the, brunt, the bunt of, of the joke, right? We don't, like, we don't like it when that happens to us. Let me tell you about a time where I was fooled. When I was in high school... Uh, my junior and senior year in high school, you can play this game. It wasn't sanctioned by the high school, uh, but it was uh, created by the students in the high school. And it was this game called Assassination. And basically how you played is you, you set up a team, and for a six-week period of time, your team was basically put up against another team in an elimination-style game where you were trying. It was basically a huge uh, water gun fight. Okay. The idea was I was trying to, on this week when I was up against this team, we were trying to squirt more people on that team sometime outside of school than they were trying to get us. And everybody paid to play. There was $1,000 that the final team was going to win if you lasted all the way to the end. It was so much fun. And I thought I knew all the tricks. My team, we made it to the final two. Made it to the final two. And at one point, towards the end of that week, my sister called me on the phone, and she said, hey, can you help me? I need you to come pick me up at a friend's house. So I'm thinking, sure. So I, I, you know, I park in a garage at my house, so I, I, I get in the car, open the garage door. I know how to leave my house without getting uh, anyone squirting me with their water gun. So I get out of my house, and I go to this friend's house, and I'm watching the whole time to make sure no one's following me, because usually you know when you got a tail, right? I know I don't have a tail. I know I can, I'm safe as soon as I get into this community. So I get out of my car and I go up to knock on the door of my sister's friend's house and then out from the bushes, the other team, and I'm wet in a matter of just seconds. You know, my own sister (laughs) sold me out for 20 bucks, $20, and a thousand dollars, right? And I'm thinking, I got fooled that, that evening. We don't like being fooled, and that's the whole idea of this series, is we don't want to be fooled. Don't be fooled. And if we understand the trick, if we understand that someone's hiding in the bushes, we're not going to be fooled by them, right? It's not going to be a surprise to us if we know what the enemy is doing, if if we understand the, the, the game that's being played. And the whole idea behind this series comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar 
with his evil schemes. In other words, we know his tricks. If we know his tricks, we won't get outsmarted. And that's the goal uh, today. It was a goal yesterday. It'll be our goal next week and the week after that as we're going through this four-week series. We want to understand that Satan is a liar. He is a fooler. And his job, the way he operates, is he wants to make you stumble. We see in John 8, we looked at this verse last week. It says, Satan has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. In fact, it says when he lies... It is consistent with who he is. It's basically a part of his character. You have to understand, you can't be surprised if Satan tells a lie because that is all he does. He is trying to fool you. And if we can understand the tricks and understand the schemes, it's more likely that we're not going to fall for them. And I want to talk about a a particular uh, lie today that is, is significant because so many people, even in this room right now, you have fallen for this lie. And it's called the lie of good enough. The lie of good enough. And let me explain, uh, ultimately the way the lie goes is this. Hey, you are good enough to go to heaven. You are good enough to spend forever with God in heaven. You are good enough. Whatever it is that you've got going on in your life, yep, it, it makes the grade. It it, 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 you're good enough. And it is amazing to me, uh, a better word would be scary to me, to see how many people believe this lie. If you go out on the street and you ask a random person, if there is a heaven and a hell, where do you think you're going to go? 80% of people will tell you that they think they're going to go to heaven. And then if you ask them a follow-up question, you say, why do you think you'll go to heaven? The very next thing out of their mouth, almost every time, is going to be something that they have done. They're going to tell you that they are good enough. Maybe it's, uh, I, I do more good things than I do bad things. Or I, I've never cheated on my taxes. I've never cheated on my spouse. I'm a, I'm a good father. I'm a hard worker. I, I did some bad things, but my good things outweighed those bad things. And they're going to explain. Most people have bought into this lie. And they'll tell you why good enough is, is basically the threshold at which they determine whether or not heaven is going to be a reality in their life. We even see this in Scripture. If you remember, there was a rich man in Mark chapter 10 who approached Jesus. And he wanted to know what it was going to take to be able to go to heaven. And let me, let me share this verse with you. It says in Mark 10, verse 17, As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. This guy is running up to him. He's excited to get an answer to this question. And then he knelt down and he asked Good teacher, check this out, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, this, this lie has some teeth to it. There's, there's a lot about the lie of good enough that makes sense in our minds. We, we, it makes sense for us to need to do something to, to go to heaven. We, you know, having an opportunity to actually ask people on the street, Are you going to go to heaven and why? Uh, We were able to get some great responses. Check out this video. In my opinion, it hasn't been determined for me yet just because I haven't really lived very long. Yes, Uh, I'm a Catholic. I don't think any of us can actually know until we die, I guess. I do believe I'm going to heaven. Um, I grew up in the church. If you believe that you deserve to go to heaven, in a way, if you believe you're you're honest and good person, that you should. I can't determine that. So, personally, I don't know if heaven exists. I kind of hope it does. After my decision making lately, I might have some repenting to do, but I definitely think that I'm going to heaven because I'm an overall good guy, good person, you know. Um, have a good attitude and I believe in God and I go to church every once in a while. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I think um, maybe if I, the rest of my life I'm a, I'm a good person, maybe. I don't think this time in my life, deter- well I don't know, maybe if I die tomorrow. I feel like 
it's more complicated of a, of a topic than people actually think. You know, it's not just like, oh, if you do think good things, you're going to go to heaven. I don't think it's as easy as that. I don't know. We'll see. I think I'm doing, I'm pursuing a career in medicine, so I'm hopefully going to be helping others my whole life. So hopefully that, that'll do some good for me. I think that just, you know, doing good deeds and being a good person that, you know, yeah, I'll probably end up in heaven, hopefully. Hopefully the big guys are uh, watching this one right now, you know. So we see how believable this lie is. Uh, we see that this lie has teeth to it. It's something that makes sense to many of us, and therefore it's something that's easy to fall for. It's easy to be fooled by this lie. It's easy to immediately answer a question of why with something you've done, even with a, a with seemingly a great answer of, I, I, I go to church. Well, do you know what? Going to church doesn't make you good enough. You know, making good decisions doesn't make you good enough. Doing more good than bad doesn't make you good enough. And that's the, the problem with this lie. The, the problem also when in this video, if you were to go out on the street and, and ask people uh, to tell you about something, uh, maybe their political views, people like to talk about that. Let me tell you what I think about guns. Let me tell you what I think about this. People have their opinions and they want to share them. If I go out and I find someone... And I say, tell me, what do you think about sports or what's your favorite team? People like to talk about that. But you go out on the street and you try to find someone who will, is willing to answer this question. And people don't like to talk about their faith. They don't like to talk about heaven. Because this lie in and of itself is designed to, in, in a way, oversimplify and to, to make you, a, in a way, a little bit confused. And to not want to think about something that you need to think about. It's much easier just to say, if I'm mostly good, then I get to go to heaven. That lie is just is such a, it's, it's a great one because it's something that makes sense to us. Let me show you actually a, a few things uh, that, that make this lie have, have some teeth. Uh, I want to explain why this lie is so believable. But before I do, would you do me a favor? I, I want to ask that, that you open your heart and your mind, and your ears this morning. I believe there's someone in this room right now, probably multiple people in this room right now, you have bought into the lie of good enough. And today, I want to ask you to consider whether or not you've, you've fallen for a lie that's, that's a lie. In fact, let's, let's pray for a moment and ask God to be with us during this time. God, I'm asking right now that you would be working in this room in a mighty way. We want, we want truth to triumph over foolishness. And God, as we know that the evil one is seeking whom he may devour, that, that Satan, in consistency with his character, is wanting to, to fool us. God, I pray that anyone in this room who has been fooled, God, that you would open their heart, you would open their mind and their ears, that they would hear from you, that you would reveal truth to them this morning. And God, for those of us who understand the truth but are constantly bombarded with this lie, I pray that you would help us to spot it and to shut it down any time it pops up in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me show you why I think this lie um, is, is so believable. Uh, three things. One, it, it seems like a fair system, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like the way we do things. If you, if you think about things like on a scale, if, if you're a good person, you deserve a reward, right? If you do something good, you should be rewarded. If you work really hard at work, you should get a promotion or get more money. If you do something bad, you should get a punishment, right? So we, we understand and, and kind of process things in a way that this system of good enough it seems like a fair system. We, we like it. It makes sense in our minds. Another reason why this lie is so believable is it seems to be in the Bible. It seems to be consistent. If you don't know God's Word really well, maybe you're new to it or you've heard of it, uh, when you think about the idea of there's a good God and a good heaven and there's this bad guy named Satan and this place called hell, there's good and evil. It's just a, a system that seems to appear in Scripture that, that the goal is good enough. 
another reason I think we love to, to believe this lie is, is that for most of us, if this lie is true, we consider it good news. 80% of people will tell you that they are good enough for heaven. Those 80%, I'm sure, love hearing this lie because to them, they're done. They just got to keep up the, make sure the good outweighs the bad. And, and to them, it's, it's good news. There's comparing yourself to your, your neighbor. It's like, hey, I, I'm better than, and most of you, you're actually thinking of a neighbor right now. You're thinking of that neighbor, and you're thinking, I'm better than that guy. And as long as I look around, and I'm better than most of the people around me, I ought to be good at the end of this life. And that's the lie of good enough. I, I'm reminded of a story. There's two hikers, and they're hiking in the forest, and all of a sudden they see a bear, a bear that is about to charge them. So they start kind of walking backwards slowly, and one of them sits down to put on his running shoes. And the other friend looks at him and says, what are you doing? Put on your running shoes. we got to get out of here. And he says, listen, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> it just... Constantly thinking, I just got to be better than this guy. I got to, as long as I'm better than the people on my right and my left, this, this ought to be good. It seems, uh, it's a system that to most of us uh, in our own minds is good news. Because we think we're a lot better than we really are. The math doesn't really add up though if 80% of us think we're better than average, huh? You know what I, I like, uh, uh, if you hear something that doesn't sound quite right, Anytime you take a lie and you put it under, under scrutiny, the lie starts falling apart. If you ask the right questions when you're exploring a claim of truth, if it's a lie, it'll be obvious really quick. In fact, right, if, if, if the police are investigating a crime, they're going to get their suspects, right, in different rooms, and they're going to ask questions because in that process of asking questions, all of a sudden the truth starts to be obvious. You start to, the, the lie starts to fall apart really quick. And what I want to do is equip us with three questions we can ask of this lie that really put it under scrutiny and help it to fall apart so you don't have to believe this lie anymore. And the first question is this, how is good defined? You have to ask yourself this question. If there is some, uh, the, some measure called good and you're trying to get over it, what is that? What is, how do we define good? Because the problem is that everyone in this room, we probably define good differently. There's something that you think is fine that I think isn't. And there's something I think is fine that you don't really care for. And, and all of us, we have our own systems and there is no standard definition of, of what good is in this, uh, under the sun. Imagine for a moment that you signed up for a college level course. And on the first day of class, you sat down in that class. And your professor got up and said, all right, guys, listen, this is what we're going to do. On the very last day of, of the semester, I'm going to give you one test. And that one test is going to determine your entire grade. That'd be a bit overwhelming just in that truth right there, right? Some of you aren't test takers. You're thinking, this is not the class for me. Now, what happens, though, if you say, well, okay, well, can we see a course syllabus? Uh, there is none. Well, will you tell us what, what books do we have to read between now and then? There are no books. I'm not going to give you any books. All right, well, what, what day do we need to be here for classes so we can take notes? There are no classes. You are here today, and then you're going to come back at the end of the semester and take a test for your entire grade without any information. Who would take that class? That just seems completely unjust and unfair. Nobody would, we would all drop that course. And yet that's the system that we sign up for when we say good enough because there is no standard of what good enough actually even means. We don't even know what good enough means. Another illustration, if you were uh, going to a job for the first day and you sat down and your boss said, listen, hey, there is no job description for this job. But in six months, we're going to get together and I'm going to see whether or not you're going to keep this job, whether or not you've been doing a good job. You would have some questions. Well, what do you want me to be doing between now and then? Listen, I've given you all the information you need. I just want you to start working. Well, what do you want me to do? Just, just start. And in six months, I'll tell you whether or not you did it or not. 
That doesn't sound like something. Imagine, imagine going to a race. You're signed up to run in a race, and you show up on race day, and you go up to the organizer, and the organizer says, uh, you go up and you say, hey, where's the starting line? Well, I don't know. Just pick a spot. Oh, all right, well, which direction should I be facing? You know, we didn't really you know, pan out a course, so just run in whatever direction you want. Wait, what? Well, when am I supposed to stop? Just keep, keep running until you, you think maybe you're, you've run far enough. We would never sign up for that race. It's, it just doesn't make sense. There's, there's no definition of where the, the boundaries are of that race and when it starts and which direction we're supposed to run and how we know whether or not we got across the finish line. And if we have this good enough lie and we've bought into it, you have to understand there is no standard of what good is. How do we define it? The whole thing falls apart under that scrutiny. I want to ask you to turn in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 3. We're going to spend most of our time this morning here in Romans chapter 3. So grab, grab a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, you can take that Bible that you find in the chair and back underneath the chair in front of you and uh, write your name in it and take it home with you. We want you to own a Bible it's so important to us that you own a Bible. We want that to be a gift for you. Uh, but I am on page 676, if you're using our church Bibles. And in uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, uh, listen to this. It says, As the Scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. The way the New King James uh, writes this same verse is it says, no one is good, and then it says, period, no, comma, not even one. In other words, it's as if the, the author, God himself, knows, I'm going to say that no one's good, and then you're going to come up with a name, and then I'm going to have to remind you what I just said. Watch. Hey, no one is good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, whoa, God, what about Mother Teresa? No, Matt, not even one. Oh, what, about, what about Billy Graham? No, not even one. Oh, what about my, my gammy? My gammy, man, every, every night I watch her, she kneels at her bed and she prays and she, she loves our family. There's no one sweeter than my great-grandma. No, Matt, not even one. It's a harsh reminder we see that when we're trying to actually define what is good, how do we define that word, we see here in Scripture that no one, not even one. And then we see in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Another way of saying this is if you are trying to get your definition of good enough by doing what the law says, you are never going to get there. The, the finish line for the race is farther than you can ever run. The grade to pass this class is so, so high that you can never get to it. In other words, if you really want to know how to define good enough, you're not going to like the answer. No one can get there. In fact, this, this verse, it really implies the reason we have the law, the reason that the Ten Commandments were created was not so that you can see them and then have something to follow so that you can be good enough. The law was created because God knew that you and I, we couldn't live up to it. And the law in and of itself, because we can't live up to it, is going to remind us how we are not good enough. We cannot live up to a law. If we give a law and we know that, the, that those following it aren't going to be able to, what it does is it reminds those following it, you are not capable of living up to this standard. You are not good enough. And The, the problem is, is there is a standard and we just don't like what it is. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We, say that next word with me, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. None of us are ever going to reach good enough. Another question we can ask that really helps 
break down this lie is, is this question, what is fair? In other words, let's just assume for a moment that we were all able to agree on what good is. We were all to define good. We were all going to come to a, an understanding of what that word means, and we were all going to agree that that definition was never going to change. So now we understand what good is. Now the question is, where is that, where, where, how much good do you got to have? Now, see, see, again, we have a problem. Is it, is, do you have to be 51% good and only 49% bad to get into heaven? Is that the standard? Is that what's fair? Is it, you know, God is so good that you got to be 70% good? you got to be almost, all mostly good in order to get to heaven? Maybe there's some of you in this room that you just, you're real merciful, and you're, or maybe you've had a lot of things going on in your life, and you're thinking, I hope it's just 15% good. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Listen, we have this, this understanding that there is no, we don't even know, if, even if we knew what good was, we don't know at, at what point that you have to have so much of that versus so much of the other. The problem is it, it all falls apart under this question. And if we're really being honest with ourselves and we want to know what is actually fair, the Bible tells us in Romans 6.23, it says this, for everyone Oh, sorry, for the wages of sin is death. In other words, if you want to know what's fair based on the way you and I have lived our lives, the truth is that because of sin and because of brokenness in our lives, the consequence of that is death. Not just an earthly death, but an eternal separation from God. That, if we're being honest, scrutinizing this lie is the truth about what is fair. The last question we can ask to really scrutinize this lie, to really help it to, to fall apart, is this question. Is Jesus a liar? In other words, if somebody tells you that you are good enough to go to heaven, the next question that you probably could ask, or any of these questions, but one of the questions you can ask them is, are you saying that Jesus had it wrong? Are you saying that Jesus wasn't telling the truth when he taught what he taught? Because Jesus, in a way, he taught the exact opposite, if you really think about it. Jesus oftentimes said that good people don't go to heaven and that bad people do. And all of a sudden now, in believing this lie, you have to really challenge the honesty of Christ. I don't recommend it. If you remember back in the day, there were people who were professional good doers. It was their, their Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's what they, they did. They had rules that they loved to follow. They actually had rules to help them follow rules. These were, these were just guys who did everything they could in their own power to be good enough. And when Jesus came into the picture, he, he pointed at these guys on multiple occasions and said, you see these guys, these guys who have dedicated their lives to trying to do good, to trying to follow rules, these guys aren't good enough. And then he puts the, the final nail in the coffin just a little while later. You remember when Jesus was being hung on the cross. He was being hung between two criminals. And these guys were bad guys. A, a lot of us, you hear that he was hung between two, two thieves. Uh, the Bible doesn't actually really say, it doesn't use that word. In fact, if they were just thieves, they would have been sold into slavery. Their life would have still served a purpose to someone. But these guys were so bad uh, another word that's often uh, used is that these guys were resurrectionists or, or uh, they, they, they like to they stir up problems. They were, they were uh, pirates in a way. They, these, guys, uh, uh, these guys like to stir up trouble and to cause a lot of problems. These guys couldn't even be trusted as slaves. And one of them, he knew how bad he was. And we see him in his last moments on the cross. He Not only does he recognize, I am hung, being, uh, hung, I was hung on this cross rightly, justly. I deserve the punishment I'm getting right now. And then he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, today, would you remember me? And in that moment, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. In another way of saying that, Jesus shouts in that moment, good people don't go to heaven. 
There was no good in that man. There was no chance. He couldn't sit there and make a deal. On, at that moment on the cross, I don't see him saying, all right, Jesus, from this point on, from this moment on, I'm not going to do that thing anymore. Do we got a deal? There was nothing that man in that moment could do except for trust in the only person who was good enough, and that was Christ. Here's what I want to close. In uh, Romans 3, I'm going to read some verses. I'm going to put them on the screen for you, but I want you to understand this truth. You and I, we are not good enough. In and of ourselves, there is nothing we can do to be good enough for heaven. There's nothing you and I can do that's that makes us good enough to spend forever with a perfect God. The only way we are made good enough is through accepting a free gift, making a decision to trust the only man ever to live who truly was good enough, and that was Jesus. And Romans 3 makes this really plain. Verses 21 through 26, we see this truth. It says, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. Listen, do you see that? God has given us a way to be good enough without being good enough. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to do it. And this is true, get this, for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet, God in His grace freely makes us good enough. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right. He makes us sinners good enough in his sight when we believe in Jesus. Satan wants you to buy into this lie. Satan wants you to walk out of this building today believing that in and of yourself, you are good enough. But the Bible is crystal clear. You and I, apart from Christ, will never be able to measure up to the standard that has been set for us. The standard is perfection. And the only way to be seen as perfect, the only way to, to have a, a good enough label on us when we when we die is through Christ and Christ alone. So I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that truth this morning. Would you do me a favor and, and bow your heads with me? I'm asking you to bow your heads this morning for the sole purpose of I don't want you to be distracted in this moment. I just want to I want you to think about something. While your heads are bowed, I, I believe that in this room many of you are, are good. I believe that you are, are mostly good people, that if we were to measure your good deeds and your bad deeds, that most of you would, would recognize that you are mostly good. But I want to challenge your way of thinking this morning. I want you to recognize that this lie of good enough is just that. It is a lie, and that the only way to be found good enough is through faith in Christ. And if you're in this, in this worship center this morning and you need to make a decision today to follow Jesus for the first time, I want to I encourage you to, with boldness, after we pray, we're going to sing a song, and I want to encourage you to respond during that time by coming up here to the altar. We'll have some of our staff and our prayer team here to, to meet you and to pray with you. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to that truth. Let me pray. God, I ask that you would be opening eyes and hearts 
right now. God, that there would be people in this room who had bought into the lie of good enough that in this moment, Satan's trick won't hold any longer. That everyone in this room would recognize the truth and that truth is that only you are able to provide us with a good enough label. That only through faith in you are we found righteous in God's sight. God, I pray for anyone in this room that needs to respond to that, that you give them the boldness and the courage this morning to come forward and respond to that, that truth. God, if, if there's someone in this room that maybe they need to bring a friend up here with them for courage, maybe there's a friend sitting next to them right now, they just need to give them a squeeze on the hand to say, I want to go up, but I need you to come with me. God, I pray that during this song, you would give us the courage to respond to how you're working in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey church, this next song, it's called Here's My Heart. And it's an incredible opportunity to respond to the gospel. It's an opportunity to say, God, here is my heart. I want to give it to you. And in the first line, it says, speak what is true. In other words, God, our prayer for you, to you this morning as a church is speak the truth into our hearts and don't let the lie beat out and win out any longer. Would you worship with me? And if you need to respond, would you come down to this altar and give your life to Christ this morning?